Hi, everyone. I'm Tony Chen, and this is Fish and Bits, a business and data podcast on the world of seafood. This week, I'm going to do a brief pivot from my typical content and instead take a macro look at the aquaculture world following the launch of two important reports that give us a unique look into the future of how the industry will continue to grow. The first report is Rabobank's forecasting report on what to expect from the industry in 2024 and the signs of optimism that they are seeing for the next year. For the two largest global aquaculture species, Rabobank is projecting a 4.8% growth for the shrimp industry and a 4.3% growth in the salmon industry after a couple tough years for both species. The second report that launched was a special report conducted by the EU Court of Auditors that reviews the impact of the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund, which allocated approximately 1.2 billion euros over the last several years to grow the industry. The audit concluded that despite pumping a huge investment into the sector over a six-year period, no tangible results have emerged. The group is quoted as saying, In fact, European aquaculture production actually seems to be at a standstill. To me, these two reports in combination show an alarming pattern. Aquaculture is and continues to be the world's fastest growing food system, but a large portion of that growth is not coming from developed nations, even when large investment efforts are placed to help grow the industry. In this episode, I'm going to go through everything you need to know coming out of these reports share some of the reasons behind what may be going on, and give you my thoughts as to what this may mean for the sector moving forward. Let's dive in. I'm sure everyone listening here is likely familiar with the graph of aquaculture. For many of us who came from other industries into aquaculture, This exponential growth curve is one of the main draws for wanting to work in the industry, seeing the opportunity to build solutions in a very quickly growing market. Many different organizations have tried to estimate what the true potential for the growth of aquaculture will be in the future. But no matter the source, everyone seems to be in agreement that the answer is that we will need more seafood. Most estimates, whether it's governmental organizations like the UN's FAO or private organizations like Rabobank, the overall agreement is that the growth will continue to land somewhere between 4 to 5% annually. Now, the obvious reason is that the population of the world will continue to grow, and therefore we need more food. But for example, as a benchmark, the corn industry is only expected to grow annually by about 1% over the next decade orders of magnitude less than what we're going to see in seafood. And one of the key organizations that keeps a very close eye on these changing patterns of the industry is Rabobank. Headquartered in the Netherlands, this Dutch bank is one of the largest agricultural banks in the world with over 600 billion euros in assets. And they fund many of the agricultural activities that are developing around the world. And obviously seafood would be one of their focus areas. Their analysts are constantly monitoring the markets to better understand the risks associated with the funding they provide. Each year, they publish a report alongside this Global Seafood Alliance on their annual future forecasts for how the markets will develop, and they just published their results for 2024 in the last couple weeks. Here are the major talking points. For the shrimp market, they expect a return to growth of about 4.8% annual growth after seeing the slight decline of 0.4% in 2022. They expect, for the most part, a large part of this growth will continue in sectors like Ecuador and a recovery back to 4% for many of the Asian countries. For salmon, Rabobank expects continued growth of about 4.3% next year, with Norway leading the way with increased volumes, while a number of smaller countries like Iceland and Australia will continue to scale, even though they're at smaller volumes, but at rates close to 10%. The report also covers a few more finfish categories, like the recovery of the tilapia growth to 5.3% globally, powered by Indonesia. They also mention Pengazia's recovery to 2.3% powered by China. And the last category they mention is the sea bass and sea bream industry, which is expected to increase by almost 4%, powered by Turkey. 
All in all, the report is a fairly optimistic view that across a number of species, the total volume output of global aquaculture will continue to grow at about that 4% growth next year. Now, the report does point out that these forecasts are expectations and other events such as unforeseen biological issues or huge weather patterns may have an impact on these forecasts. Additionally, the report also includes a survey to seafood executives to share what they are most concerned with when it comes to the industry moving forward. The top four concerns that responders answered with were, in order, market prices at number one, the cost of feed at number two, market access at number three, and disease prevention at number four. These all make sense as consumer spending and inflation is impacting if not all parts of the world, and issues like the Peruvian anchovy fisheries, which supplies a massive portion of the global fish meal market used in aquaculture, are both recent issues that will squeeze profit margins for farmers around the world. That said, I think the most interesting part of the report is the highlight of where growth is expected to come from over the next few years. In salmon, Norway is consistently growing at a similar pace to what we've seen in the last decade, whereas Canada, Chile, and UK are all showing stagnation. There's fast growth happening in some of the other countries like Iceland and Australia. But even given the fast pace, the volumes that they're growing at are still quite small. In shrimp, Ecuador looks to continue their dominance and growth, even if it's not at the same rate that we've seen over this last decade. But Rabobank is also projecting large jumps for many other South American countries like Brazil, Venezuela, Peru, and Honduras. And as for some of the other species, Indonesia, Brazil, and Colombia are some of the other regions that are quickly growing in finfish, and in particular tilapia. The pattern here seems to be that outside of one country, Norway, the Western world is basically not where aquaculture is primed for growth. Instead, it's happening in countries exclusively not based in Europe or North America. But why is this the case? And the second report I'm going to talk about today may be able to provide some insights. In the last week, the EU Court of Auditors, or the ECA, reviewed the impact of the funding supplied by the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund, which was allocated for the years of 2014 to 2020. The entire fund is roughly 6 billion euros, and 1.2 billion of that, or roughly 20%, was allocated specifically for growth of aquaculture. The fund's successor, similarly named the European Maritime Fisheries and now Aquaculture Fund, has another 1 billion euros allocated through 2027 to grow the industry sustainably. Comparatively, this total amount for the first allocation is substantially higher than what the EU had spent in the six years prior to 2014. It's roughly three times what they spent during the period of 2007 to 2013. And the reason to increase the funding makes sense. The EU noted that its member countries currently represent less than 1% of global aquaculture production, and that imported seafood products represent roughly 60% of the total EU seafood supply. These funds were allocated with the intention to grow aquaculture sustainably and deliver economic, social, and employment benefits to the region while cutting down on their seafood deficit. The conclusion that was reached, however, differs quite a bit from that stated goal. The committee's conclusion, quoted in their report, reads, We conclude that while the EU strategic framework for aquaculture has improved in recent years, EU aquaculture has seen little growth and there is no reliable indicators to track the sector's sustainability or the contribution of the increased EU funding to the development of EU aquaculture. Throughout the entire report, there are some very strongly worded language that even with the most optimistic perspective doesn't showcase much return for such a large investment. Here are a few examples. Since 2014, EU aquaculture production has stagnated in terms of volume and employment has decreased. There are currently no indicators available to monitor the environmental sustainability of EU aquaculture. And lastly, The data reported in the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund's monitoring system is not adequate to assess the fund's contribution to the aquaculture sector's environmental and social sustainability or its competitiveness. So what happened to all the money and what is going on? 
Well, in order to understand what's happening, we need to take a look at where the funds go and how they are used. As part of the audit, the committee selected a number of EU member countries based on the amount of funding they received. In general, the funds were allocated towards countries that had larger industries, so the committee looked at a combination of countries that included Greece, Spain, France, Italy, Poland, and Romania. Together, these countries represented 71% of total EU aquaculture production and received 61% of the total funding. And when you dive into what the audit committee found as some of the challenges that hampered growth, it may not be what you think are the reasons why. Interestingly enough, the committee noted that the absorption rate for the fund was actually below that of other EU priorities. In many of the countries I mentioned, they didn't actually reach the amount of funding that was allocated for the size of their industry. And the committee pointed out to some interesting reasons why. And much of it comes down to licensing. The committee noted that three of the six member states I mentioned, namely Greece, Italy, and Romania, did not have an approved maritime spatial plan completed, even though that was supposed to be required by 2021 as part of this funding program. The auditors also found that a number of plans that were only just approved in 2023, and many had not even started drafting plans. And without a maritime spatial plan, the licensing systems needed to build new farms simply can't happen. And the auditors pointed that out. They noted that the time needed for licensing processes for most of the part remained stable or actually increased in certain cases. In Poland and Spain, no new maritime aquaculture permits were granted through the entire period of 2014 to 2020. But what is keeping these countries from developing the necessary plans to grow their aquaculture industries? The EU is literally providing money aimed to help these companies grow their own farming sectors, decrease seafood deficits, and add jobs to the economy. You would expect the money to be oversubscribed with these projects, not the opposite. Well, the reason I'm going to throw out there as a potential hypothesis are the strategic guidelines that the European Parliament point out as to the areas they wanted to see work being done on with the use of these funds. They pointed out three areas as challenge areas that these funds should be addressing. Those were increasing organic aquaculture production, algae production, and sustainable feeds. And while these three areas are without a doubt valuable pursuits, They are incredibly risky business choices. Each of these categories have unsolved challenges that don't guarantee long-term success for the industry. Let's take algae or seaweed production for an example. Many countries around the world are investing heavily in the sector, but the industry is fairly aware that the processing and end consumer doesn't exist yet for what will happen after large volumes of seaweed are grown. To me, These risks are too much for countries and their politicians to spend their efforts to support. The potential upside gain for any of these EU countries just simply doesn't outweigh the risks. Add on to the potential negative backlash that they may get from environmental NGOs. Why take the chance? Here's an interesting point that I discovered as I was looking into how the EU was looking to respond to the use of these funds. The WWF, or World Wildlife Fund, along with a few other NGOs, spent the time to author a seven-page document that highlighted 15 recommendations for how to best use this next round of funding that was allocated for 2021. Within this document, there was zero mention of aquaculture outside of the name of the fund. Literally zero. Now, it would make sense if these recommendations were all in support of wild populations of fish, because I know the primary mission as the NGO is to protect wildlife around the world. But conversely, most of their recommendations were about the support of small fishermen. One of their recommendations stated, promote diversification so fishers can develop new business activities using their knowledge and experience in sectors such as sustainable tourism. You would think that aquaculture could be mentioned in some way into this picture, especially considering the fact that 20% of the funding of this total fund is aimed at going towards aquaculture specifically. 
Now, I know it's easy to get upset about this, but the case is just an example of the challenge that many of these EU countries have in supporting more aquaculture projects and activities. And when you combine this report with what Rabobank is projecting for the development of the industry in the years to come, a common pattern tends to be seen. In the survey responses, the political, licensing, and labor concerns aren't as high as market prices, the cost of feed, and disease for many of the executives who submitted answers into their survey. These executives are focused on the profitability of their business and finding opportunities around the world to continue to fill the demand for seafood. To me, these trends and patterns are extremely interesting to take a deeper look into. At the end of the day, funding from private organizations like Rabobank and public funds like the EU will dictate how the industry will grow moving forward. But isn't it crazy that countries like Greece and Turkey, which share the same exact waters of the Aegean Sea, are on completely different paths for growth? I certainly think so. And that's all for today. Thank you for listening. As always, if you find this content interesting, please share this podcast with a friend and make sure to follow us. We publish new episodes every Monday. Hope you have a great week.